Okay, we have a bit of a limitation of time, but I'll try to give you some idea of the options. You've already heard uh, passionate from the lady there saying, you know, I have the implants, why can't we all have it? Why can't it all be used? And so I'll, I'll look into that to tell you what the situation is in terms of the benefits of having an implant and, and clearly discuss with you some of the difficulties we're having now. So you, you know about a disease, you, you have the disease, you have read about it. And the, the thing I want to highlight here is the issue that we, we don't see any systemic association. So as uh, Professor Stanford just said, it's an ideal scenario if you can find a good local therapy to avoid the exposure to drugs that might produce a problem to your general health. Um, this is what we normally see and this is what makes it very classic. So anyone presenting with this kind of picture, the diagnosis will be made very quickly because it's really very, very typical. But as we heard before, uh, a lot of patients don't read the books when they come, so we don't have the, the eyes looking the way that we're expecting them to, and that's what generates some delay. Um, we, we do monitor, as you know very well, uh, we uh, explain that vision itself is not a very good way of monitoring the disease because it reflects a, a function of a very limited part of the retina. There's a lot more going on. The difficulties you heard about night vision and, and other things is all related to dysfunction of the, the retina as a whole. So we use methods to, to monitor that, visual fields, electrodiagnostics, so you saw all that before. And, and this is an example of how visual fields are used, and they are very useful. We, we've just done some work with Mark Westcott, and, and it shows very well they're very useful in the monitoring of patients. So visual, uh, the electrodiagnostics and visual fields can be combined for that. I'm not going to go through this because uh, it's, time is a bit limited, but I want to go into the, the devices themselves. So the first device that was actually tested was the Retisert, which was designed to release this fluocinol and acetonide over a period of up to three years. Actually, it's two and a half years, more or less, that it, it seems to release the drug at meaningful levels. And the levels detected systemically are very insignificant, which means it's not a threat to your health in general. This is what the implant looks into the eye, and actually this is a photograph of a patient who's actually sitting in the audience today. This was done back in 2002. So it was the first implant that I put when the trial was starting at that time. So this shows the overall response. This is a study we did. It wasn't birdshot study, but there were birdshot patients in there, and it showed very well that the device in the eye was capable of preventing recurrences of the diseases. So it would control the disease in a way that the standard of care drugs were not able to do. But it showed here the, the recurrence rate, everything was very positive. So the device was protective, was preserving vision, was reducing inflammation, and controlling recurrences. But it did not come free of problems. So the rate of pressure problems was very high. And, and in two different trials, you could see the number of people needing surgery to control their pressure was quite high. It was about 30% in this study, 40% in another study, which means it was a significant problem. And the other problem was cataract, which by far most patients would develop after some time. So this device was approved by the FDA. It's still used quite widely in the US. A lot of colleagues there use that very, very frequently. But in Europe, it was rejected by the EMA. And the grounds for rejection was the fact that they needed more data. And some of the data going back to animal studies, which put off uh, Al Bausch and Lomb in doing any more work on this in Europe, and they decided to withdraw the application and the drug was never licensed here. So at the moment in Europe, you cannot get it under, you can use it, but you have to buy it and, and it's not gonna be funded. And of course, you can have the operation done privately and all that can be done, but it's very expensive. It's a very expensive uh, device. Um, so the summary here is pretty much what I just told you regarding the, the efficacy of the implant demonstrated by the study and the complications that would come as a consequence of having the implant in the eye, which we argued we, with the EMA at the time that many patients with uveitis will develop a cataract as a consequence of their disease and may develop glaucoma as well. So for them, the trade of saying, okay, well, I, I don't mind having a cataract and glaucoma because I can treat that, but at least I don't have to take the drugs. And that was an argument that we did use with the EMA, but unfortunately, uh, it wasn't enough, and they decided not to accept it. Uh, there are some studies that were published, and, and this is coming from Dr. Foster's group. Uh, and, and essentially, as you say here, this implant, the conclusion is a bit low down here, helps control inflammation in patients who have refractory disease, such as birdshot cases here. That's exactly what we're looking at, and, but associated 
side effects of cataract and ocular hypertension requiring intervention. So those data there published uh, from the, the specific study and the other studies that show that it, it works well. And just to show you here, the, the, this is the, the patient that we're seeing in terms of the demographics and, and showing all the drugs this patient had been using and, and certainly patients having problems of uh, the, ret the indication for the retro search you can see here, failure of treatment, intolerance to treatment, persistent disease. So all these patients were being treated very with everything they could and were having problems either with the drugs or not responding well to the medications used. And this is to show here what happened once they had the implant in the eye. You can see that the, towards three years, a lot of the patients were not needing any other medication, with one or another patient still requiring treatment. But the majority of the patients managed to, to, to go from needing treatment to not needing anything. So that was a, 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 just confirming the impression that we had that the implant does work. And this is to show here uh, the proportion of patients with active inflammation. So we started up here, and by those two years in onwards, the inflammation was under control. So it did provide very good control of the inflammatory response. Uh, this is another study that's coming from another group, uh, also regarding the, the fluoxetine, the retrocert implant in patients with birdshot. Uh, and essentially, what they're saying here is effective in controlling inflammation, reducing the use of systemic immunotherapy patients tend to have more robust intraocular pressure response. This is something that it may be related to one, one point. You know that birdshot doesn't run with an anterior uveitis of any significance. You don't usually need eye drops. Probably most of you have never been giving an eye drop to treat your disease. It's mainly either injections or tablets that you use. So the reason for the pressure problem is if you don't have an uveitis at the front of the eye, your ciliary body is secreting your aqueous humor at a normal rate. So if your drainage is impaired by the steroid, your pressure is more likely to misbehave in relation to someone who has impaired production of fluid, which is what happens in patients that were compared to here with other forms of uveitis. That's a, a theory behind why the birdshot patients may have more pressure problems with their eyes. I'm going to skip that. This is an example here. This is a situation when we have a, the implant was put here. This is the dotted line and was put in the right eye. And you can see this is the amplitude of the electrodiagnostic wave here, the, the P50 in the pattern ERG. And it shows that after the implant was put in, the right eye went really well. And the left eye that didn't have the implant didn't do very well. These two arrows indicate moments when the patient received injections to try to protect the left eye. And those injections produced a, a certain peak of improvement, but didn't really maintain a function at the same level that the implant was allowing in the fellow eye. Same situation here, now the 30 hertz flicker, which Omar mentioned to you, which is a very sensitive way of measuring retinal functioning in this situation. And you can see the implant was put in here, and the implicit time, which is the peak time, means the response, the speed of response to the retina improved significantly in that red line, which is the right eye, but in the fellow eye, it didn't do well. Just a bit of an improvement here when the injections were given, but again, very erratic and, and usually not very good. And finally, here the amplitude, which means the size of the wave. Again, the right eye, which had the implant, behaving much better than the fellow eye that didn't have the implant. So it shows very well in a patient, a real case situation, that the implant protected the eye that received it in terms of the retinal function, while the other eye was still suffering problems and, and losing function over time. This is another example, so pretty much the same interpretation of the different waves in the electrodiagnostic. And this is something we presented at a meeting, is exactly the, the data that I've showed you now, just to, to highlight the efficacy of this implant in protecting the eye. The Ozordex is, is another implant. This is a very different implant. It's a different drug. It's a dexamethasone implant instead of fluocinolone. It's a biodegradable implant, so it disappears inside the eye. The retrocert needs an operation to put into the eye, cut the eye wall, put implant in, and suture it to the eye wall, and it's dangling in there behind your lens. So that's what the retrocert is, involves an operation. This one here is an injection that you get inside your eye using this applicator, and essentially it delivers the drug into the vitreous, and it will disappear over time. That time is supposed to be six months, but in practical terms, it's not as long as that. We see it much shorter duration of the effect. Four months, eventually, three, four months is what we tend to see. So is this a useful drug? Well, the trial that was used to 
approved licensed this drug that was not in burn shot specifically, it was a uveitis trial, non infectious posterior uveitis, and it demonstrated the ability of the implant to control inflammation at the back of the eye in terms of the vitreous haze, which was a, as a primary outcome measure of this study, and also looking at improvement in visual acuity. So the implant, it, it works for non infective posterior uveitis to lead to reduction of the inflammatory activity but it doesn't last very long, which means that you're going to, you have a similar effect. I compare, maybe my colleagues may disagree, but I compare it similarly to the intra vitro trimacinolone injections that we tend to give in terms of duration of the effect. It's more or less the same. In terms of how long it lasts, it's going to be about the same. The point is, the, intra, the trimacinolone is more likely to produce a pressure reaction than the dexamethasone implant is, at least on the data we have so far. So from the pressure point of view, it seems that the Ozrodex is not as bad as the injections that we, we tended to give before. So is this the answer? I think the problem is you have a chronic disorder, you're going to be injected every three to four months. doesn't sound like a very good alternative uh, with all the risks involved in doing this. And these are some papers that have been published specifically for birdshot. And I think Andrew has been involved in one publication that had birdshot patients in other DAX showing that there is a benefit, but the duration of that benefit is not prolonged. This is the Illuvian. I'm going to make a bracket here. Illuvian is not the right name to use. Illuvian is a, is a trade name from Alimera Science, which produced this, this device that will inject this drug into the eye, which is being licensed for use in diabetic macular edema. There is another company called PC Vida. It's a, a, a company, American company, uh, led actually by an English guy uh, who is uh, producing, trialing the same different plant for uveitis. And we don't know what commercial name it will have at the end, how the injector is going to look like, but we know it's, we have involved in a trial and the data is being, we're collecting data over time now. But that's what it looks like. It's a bit more of a rod, a bit longer than the Ozordex is. It's can it be injected also through an injector with a smaller gauge needle than the Ozrodex is. So it doesn't need to be the tunnel that you have with the Ozrodex to prevent uh, uh, leakage, uh, gaping. You, ha you can go straight into the eyes at 25 gauge rather than nearly 23, which is what you get with the Ozrodex. So what it does, it has a lot less drug inside than the Retisert. The Retisert had 0.59. This one here is 0 0.18. There's a lot less drug in inside that pellet to be released over a similar period of time, up, up to three years. So you can imagine that the amount of drug released on a chronic base, daily basis is much less than the register is releasing during the same time. So I'm just going to skip that. And I'll go in. So this is what it looks like. This is the size. This is the Illuvian. This is the one that is commercially available, licensed for diabetes at the moment. And this is what it does in the eye. Initially, I thought it would release the drug from both ends, and it doesn't. It's just from one end. So one end is closed, and the drug is released from the other end. Uh, this is an example here. These are a, f a couple of patients I've injected with Illuvian for birdshot. They were intolerant to their medications and unwilling to try other things and accepted the fact that I didn't know if this was going to help or not. I, I was very, very honest with them. I said, this is something we have not been using in birdshot. I don't know if it's going to help you or not. So especially considering the cost, which is very high, I wanted to be very careful. And, and the first patient accepted, let's go for one eye, let's measure the response and decide if we do the second eye, if the response is good. So the response was so good that, that when she came back a few weeks later, she said, I can already feel the difference in this eye. Could be a placebo effect, yes. Could be that she was so excited about it that she wanted to feel better. But I could see when I looked into her eye that there was a difference in the way I could look at the back of the eye and the way the retina looked like. And this is to show, this is a pre-Illuvian and post-Illuvian angiograms showing that the, the leakage, that the wetness of the retina significantly reduced. So the, the components of the retinal disease of birdshot responded very well. This is, another, this is the same patient, the other eye, just showing again, this is the eye injected second. So this photograph is reflecting a, lo, a, a smaller period of benefit of the drug, but again shows a reduction. Some of the changes you see here are representing pigment epithelial changes rather than active leakage uh, into the eye. And this is to show the electric side and Chris Hogg is sitting there, so I need to be careful what I say here because he might say I'm saying rubbish. But this is the normal uh, readings. And what I want to stress here is this is pre-treatment and post-treatment for the first eye that was injected. And you can see there is already a trend 
as we look here at the, the amplitude in the, the PERG that is already improving, the pattern ERG is improving, and we can see the implicit time is beginning to go down towards. So it's an early manifestation, but they were considered uh, significant changes at that stage. You can see here again, this is another, the other patient, uh, this is a totally different patient with the two eyes implanted, and we can see again that the implicit time was coming down following the injection, indicating improvement, and also the improvement that you see in the pattern ERG and the amplitude of the wave. So there has been a positive response to the electric response of the eye and a positive response in the appearance of the back of the eye and the way the, the angiogram looks like. So I think at the moment, and I'm going to make it short, we, we all know that, that we are predominantly using systemic therapy. They don't allow a very strict control. You all know very well your disease can go up and down. That's why I'd be reflecting absorption of the drug, the fact that you have to change your amount of medication for one reason or another. You know, depending on steroids, as Andrew said before, is, this, is the one drug that really shows the bad side over time. And, and we know that it works. If you give a lot of steroids, your eye behaves very well, but the rest of you falls apart. So it's not, it's not an alternative. It's not the way you want to treat this disease. Um, the other drugs have their own problems. We all know that. You all know that, how you feel about taking the drugs and, and different side effects. All of you experiment a different problem when you take the drug, and we have to accept that you're different individuals and it will be a problem. The short-lived local therapies, such as the Ozordax or the injections, I don't think are a good alternative. They will eventually carry more problems, and they are not allowing a good flat control of the disease. I think controlling the disease more in a stable way is likely to be more beneficial than allowing it to go up and down, which is what probably happens with the short-lived effect. And the long-acting ones, they look better. What I don't know yet, we have very small number of Illuvian cases or the, the fluosinone implant cases. Uh, we're going to have a trial at Moorfield starting in the new year, which is going to be dedicated to using the, this implant in 10 birdshot patients to allow us more data, because I want to know if the retina works well, which seems to be, is the choroid also responding in the same way, which is the inflammation under the retina. It's important to show that both are being treated, not only one because otherwise the disease might still be going on and we are just happy to see that part of it's treated, which is not a good idea. So I need more data, so I, I would caution here, optimistic caution that it looks positive, but we need more time and more data to show it really works and then be able to tell you, yes, I think it's worthwhile going for that and then hopefully getting it licensed and approved for you to have access to. I think the, the battle is there. We all fight in this. I, I had, a, just to mention a problem that uh, happened to us recently, I had the donation of 20, about 20 of these implants given, offered to me from the company that is trialing it, which was, I could not bring into the country because it was blocked by the government saying, I cannot bring it in because the Luvian is available, it's a market competition issue, and you're not supposed to bring another product into the country. So 20 free implants that were not, could not bring in for regulations which are beyond my understanding. But anyway, thank you very much.